Welcome to 15721 at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm the instructor for this course, Andy Pablo. As I posted on Piazza, I can't be in Pittsburgh right now. I'm actually in Amsterdam with my friend 187 Owen. Uh, the problem is that 187 booked us a hotel, but it's actually not the kind of hotel we'd want to stay at. So right now we're just kind of hanging out here in the red light district, trying to figure out what we need to do next. But Owen lost all his money, uh, and I don't have my credit card with me right now, so we're kind of homeless. So I figured now would be a good time to sit down and uh, cover the first lecture for everyone. So before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's been down with us since the very beginning, JL in Seattle, MC in, in California, and EZE in, in Brooklyn. Right, these people have been staying true for us since the very beginning. I also want to acknowledge that this semester we are being sponsored by two foundations, or two groups. Uh, the first is the Amazon database group. Um, Amazon is actually surprisingly one of the largest database vendors. Uh, everything they do is on the cloud. And a lot of the topics that we'll be talking about uh, in this semester are relevant to the kind of systems that they are building. And, and so they are helping out with course development. We're also being funded by a uh, nonprofit called the Steve Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real. And again, they are helping out with paying for TAs and lecture notes and other things. So we appreciate both of them with helping us out. And for Amazon, they will come giving a guest lecture later in the semester. So, right, so today's agenda, the things we want to discuss are first the overview of what the course and the semester will look like if you're a student at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and then I just want to do sort of a fun lecture to, uh, about the history of databases just to provide some context about what the, you know, what the kind of modern systems we talk about today, what, thing, you know, what things have people tried in the past. So if you're not enrolled in the course and you want to skip ahead to this video, you should skip ahead to the history of databases. Everything else is just for people that are, that are here at CMU. So the first thing I want to get to discuss is why should you take 15721? Why should you take this course? So I say this every semester, and every semester I, it continues to be true. Um, right now, database system developers are in huge demand, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in the United States, all over the world. And it's because that there's a lot of unsolved problems in, in databases, data management, processing, uh, and, and these companies can't hire people fast enough. So you know, if you take this course, you'll be you know, and you do well in it, you'll be immediately hireable or immediately employable, and that's you know, that's a good thing. The other thing I'll say also too is that if you, even if you don't go off and end up spending your career writing database systems or building database systems, the things that you'll come across or learn uh, throughout the semester are, are going to be applicable to almost every other aspect of, of computer science or information technology. And what will happen is that you'll see is that the, the, the people that are you know, good enough to write code for database management systems, in addition to operating systems or embedded systems, you know, you can get pretty much a job in any other application domain. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a database system programmer and you want to write JavaScript code, people will hire you. But if you're a JavaScript programmer and you want to data, write a database system, you know, that may be a harder, harder sell, right? So the, the kind of systems background you'll get out of this course you know, is, goes beyond just database systems, but we're going we're gonna to discuss these things in the context of databases because that's all I really care about. I can just give you sort of the, a brief alumni role of... Uh, the students that have taken this class and where, where they've gone to, right, this is just a, it's a subset of the students that have, that have taken 721 uh, and then hung out with us and worked in our system even further at CMU. And they're all, everyone's gone off either to grad school or are, are now building database systems at, at you know, either companies that build databases or you know, startups that are specifically just building database systems. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. And then the companies can't hire our students fast enough. All right, so the goal of this course is to you know, give you the background and understand about the bottom practices in building database systems. Um, and as part of that, you'll become better at, at doing you know, sort of low-level systems programming. So the goal is that by the end of the semester, you'll learn what it means to write correct and performant system code. Right? In the context of databases, we we, care, we need both, right? You, you don't want to lose data, so you want, your, you want your system to be correct. And obviously you want to process the data as fast as possible, or query as fast as possible. So you want to be, uh, you know, have, support high performance. 
So I'm sort of in my ivory tower in academia, and I like to say, like, oh, correctness matters first, performance comes second, and that's how I'll teach things. Um, in practice, in the real world, that's not always followed. You definitely you, you look at examples like MongoDB or MySQL, you know, wildly successful database systems uh, that are used all over the world, and they started off with going for performance first and then correctness second. So the other thing you'll learn about in this course is that we will teach you proper documentation and testing for your database system. Uh, you also learn how to do code reviews and you work uh, in a larger code base. Right, so these are things just beyond the university. These are things that uh, you know th th help you out through your career no matter where you go. And the, the, the major tech firms, when I ask them what are they interested in, my students taking this course, what kind of, you know, do, what they, do you want them to learn B plus Gs or locking code? They always tell me they want students that are able to work independently on a large code base. So that's not something I would take lightly. That's something that you know, I think doesn't come easy for a lot of people, especially me. And this is something you'll, you'll, you'll get exposure to uh, during the semester. All right, so the sort of core umbrella topic for this semester will be single node in-memory database systems. And so that means that we're going to ignore, a for the most part, uh, writing data out the disk as part of like a, a disk ordinary database system, and I'll explain what that is uh, later on. And we're also going to ignore the problems and challenges when you have a distributed database system. So it's not to say distributed databases are not important. It's just to say that for this course, we're going to focus on getting the single node system working as fast as possible and as correct and correct correctly. And we don't worry about going distributed, right? It's in my opinion, it's better to have a a database system that works well on a single node and try to scale that vertically before you go to a distributed environment and try to scale horizontally, because that brings in a whole bunch of other challenges. So this means that we're not going to cover things like a census protocol. Uh, or fault tolerance uh, at, at a wide scale. We care about these things, but not just here. And so this course is also not uh, going to be on classical database management systems. So that means that we're not going to cover you know, the, the basics as we did in the introduction class about two-phase locking or B plus trees and things like that. I'm going to assume you know those things. And instead, what we're going to cover are state-of-the-art implementations and other topics that, that modern systems are using today. Right? So this is going beyond what we cover in the, in the intro class. So the kind of things that we'll talk about during the semester are concurrency control, indexing, data structures, storage models, database compression, how to execute joins uh, in parallel or ve with vectorized execution models, uh, networking protocols, logging recovery, and then we'll spend a lot of time at the end of the semester talking about uh, query compilation and query optimization. All right, these are sort of the sort of the more modern things that you don't we don't really get the chance to cover in the uh, in, in the introduction class. So as I said already, I'm going to assume if you're taking this course that you already have uh, taken another database course, whether it's 15, 445, 645 at Carnegie Mellon, or at your undergraduate institution, some kind of intro to databases. So and the reason why I'm going to assume this is because we're going to discuss modern variations of the classical algorithms that are designed for what today's hardware looks like. So I'm not going to teach you what, how to do a hash join. I'm going to teach you how to do a vectorized parallel hash join right, that can run multiple cores with SIMD instructions. Right, so this is sort of you need to understand the basic way a hash join works in order to understand how to do the, uh, sort of the, 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 the modern implementation of it. So the core background that I'm going to assume you, you already have would obviously be SQL because we're going to focus on relational databases. Uh, serializable theory or concurrent control theory, relational algebra, and then the basic algorithms and data structures for sort of classic databases. Again, B plus trees, um, Aries, uh, two-phase locking, and so forth. Things like that. So the course policies and the schedule is all available on the course webpage. Right? There's a syllabus, there's a schedule, and I'll cover what the schedule means in a, in a few more slides. But any questions you have about what the course uh, sort of how the course will be held and how it'll be graded, you can always refer to the course webpage. Now, in terms of academic honesty, I, I encourage you to go look at what CMU's policy is on their, on their webpage um, about what plagiarism and what cheating means. If you're doing something like copying a piece of code that you're not sure whether that's okay or not, uh, I encourage you to please ask me. Um, I'd rather you have asked me and, we, and you and I discuss it and see whether you're doing the right thing or what you're doing is okay. Um, rather than me catch you cheating and I have to go, you know, go report you to Porner Hall, right? So, you know, 
let's not plagiarize, let's not be stupid. If you have questions, just ask me. All right, so I'm holding office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays uh, at 1.30, 2.30, immediately after this class uh, in my office in Gates. Uh, if that time is not good for you, then please email me uh, and we can make an arrangement for another time. So if you come to my office hours, what can we talk about? Well, a lot of times students want to come talk about implementing their projects or if they read the paper and not sure about what, uh, you know, if they fully understand it. Um, but there's other you know, sort of life things you want to talk about. Uh, I'm happy to do that as well, like how to get a job as a database engineer or database, database developer. If you want an introduction to a database company in a certain state or region, I can definitely do that for you. And then because of my background, I think I'm qualified to talk about how to handle police. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where, you, you, you know, because you do databases, you may end up in, in a bad place and, you know, you need some help getting out of it. So by all means, come talk to me. I'm happy to do so. Uh, we have one TA uh, this semester. Uh, he's chill as uh, Matt Butrovich is a second year PhD, or second one and a half. It's not clear what he actually is. Uh, PhD student with me in the CS department. Uh, he's actually a student that took 721. F crushed it, and I encouraged him to hang out and be a PhD student, and now he's here. So he is currently the lead architect or developer helping build our, our database system at CMU, and this is what you'll be using for all the projects. Uh, before actually coming to CMU, uh, he was, he's from LA, so he was like an ex-gang member of the s uh, you know, so he's, he's, he's ridiculous. Uh, but actually right now, since I've sort of got him on the right path as being a PhD student, he is, uh, now I'm training him as a licensed boxing manager, so he's going to be a, a cage fighter. Um, he's currently undefeated, and, you know, through our training, we hope that it will continue to be this way. So. Any development questions that I can answer, I, I encourage you to go ask Matt, because uh, he will know more, more things about the internals of our database system than I do. All right, so the, the breakdown for what's expected for you this semester is the following. Uh, so there's reading assignments, programming projects, final exam, and extra credit. So one change we made this year than previous years is that I dropped the uh, midterm exam in, in brought along a, brought back the second programming project because I think students got more out of it th last year than the midterm exam. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what that is as we go along. And there's two additional reading assignments than previous years. So the, if you go to the course set schedule on the webpage, you will see that for every single day there's a sort of a broad topic of what will be discussed for that lecture. And then there's a list of readings. And one of the readings will have this orange or yellow star next to it. Uh, and that's the mandatory reading for that class. That should sort of be the primary paper that we will cover in the lecture. So before each class, you're required to submit a uh, review of or synopsis of, of this paper um, that just discusses like the overview or the, and the main takeaway of, of what the proposed system actually does. Um, and, and you have to submit this through this form online, which is just a Google form. And so in addition, in, in the synopsis, it also has to include, you know, what system they used for their evaluation and, and whether they modified it and how they modified it, and then what work list they did to evaluate their, their proposed method. And this last one is actually really important because when you do the final project and you want to measure how your system, you know, whether the system actually improved or got faster or, or whatever you're modifying, you want to go see what the work list are that people are using uh, in these other papers and, and you know, apply the same... Uh, apply the same experiments to, to your own implementation. So the reviews are, the synopsis are due uh, at 11.59 a.m. <coughs> right before class. <coughs> oh, that stinks. <coughs> oh, that's harsh. Oh, that's sticky. Um, the uh, the reviews are, are due right before class, and there's no late days. But you're allowed to skip four readings throughout the entire semester, um, and then your final grade will be based on you know, the ones that you do submit. All right, so again, please don't plagiarize these writings. I think other people uh, follow along in the course on YouTube, or I've looked at the previous years, and sometimes you can find the, the synopsis on, on GitHub. Don't plagiarize, don't copy from each other. All right, we'll run everything with Moss, and if we catch you, then we have to report you. Again, so again, don't, don't be stupid. All right, so now the bulk of the grade we comprised are based on the programming projects. So we are building a new database management system here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't have a public name yet. Uh, the repository is currently named after my dog, 
which is just Terrier. Uh, and that's not going to be the name of the system because that's not a good name for a database system. Um, so we will announce the name later in the semester and, and you know, post the website, uh, publish the website once, once we get the, the first version out. Um, but the things you care about is that it's going to be a modern code base that's written in C++ 11 or C++ 17. Uh, it's multi-threaded. We use LLVM to do query compilation. Again, I'll explain what that is uh, throughout the semester. Everything's open source. It's designed to be Postgres compatible. Um, so it'd be easier for you to actually inter in, you know, interact with this thing uh, use, using the terminal. So all the programming projects will be based on this, and we're going to use GitHub to, to manage everything. So uh, Matt will be running a recitation later, uh, early next week, to give you an overview of how the system uh, source code is laid out um, and, and give sort of pointers on how to get started on the first project. So we'll announce that, where that's going to be on Piazza uh, later this week. So all the development you're going to do is on your local machine. The database system currently builds on Linux and OS X. I think somebody has tried to build it on Windows with the uh, Ubuntu uh, sort of packages. I haven't tried this. I don't know whether it works. Um, but we'll also provide a, with a Vagrant VM uh, file that you can just download if you want to run, run this on a Linux VM on your, on your Windows machine. So you do all the development on your local machine, but for the first, first and second project, and potentially for the third project, you'll want to do all your benchmarking and sort of performance tests using Amazon uh, because they'll, or an EC2 machine, because you can get a machine that has more cores than your local laptop does. So we'll provide everyone with uh, uh, coupons or credit uh, codes you can use on Amazon to get uh, you know, a, a couple bucks to get, get these machines so you're not paying out of pocket. And so we'll send that information out uh, a later, later, this, uh, later this semester. So the first two projects, uh, we're going to provide you with the test cases and the scripts and provide you clear instructions on what you need to mod you know, modify in the system for, you, for your project. Uh, we're also going to teach you how to profile the, the system like using perf or call grind, because this is presumably some, not something that most students have uh, experience with. So the first project will be completed individually. Um, the second project will be done in a group of three. So currently the class has roughly 36 people, so it'll be about 12 or 13 groups of three people. I like to keep it at three people because that's sort of the, it's not too few and not too many. Um, the, I, with some exceptions, we'll take on a case-by-case -case basis. If we have extra people, we could do a four or, or three, or four or two-person group. Um, but again, most, everyone else should be in a, a three-person group. So it's okay for you to start thinking about what group you want to join to get right now. The third project will be, uh, will be the group project, and this will be something that you get to choose to build in our system. And so it has to be something that's relevant to the materials or topics we discuss in the class. It has to be, uh, require a significant programming effort from everyone that's on your team, and it has to be you know, unique. You, know, you can't have two groups work on the same project, and obviously has to be approved by me. So don't freak out about this now. You don't have to pick a project until the... We come after, uh, after spring break, and then I'm also going to provide uh, some sample project topics that you can choose from uh, to, to, to build in our system. So again, for the first and second project, uh, please don't plagiarize. Please don't copy from each other. Um, if you're borrowing a library for project two, that's probably not necessary. Project three, again, come talk to me. But again, don't be stupid. Don't copy, and w nobody will have any problems. All right, so the final exam will be a take-home exam, and that'll be long-form questions based on the mandatory readings of topics and discussed in the class. Uh, I'll give it out in class on April 22nd, as when, which is also the same day that the guest speaker will be coming and give a lecture. Um, and then it'll be due uh, potentially the last day of class, a week later, or when we do the final project presentations. I, I haven't decided yet. All right, and the extra credit for this semester is the same as we did in the intro class. Uh, so we are writing an encyclopedia of database systems at, at Carnegie Mellon. I currently know about, I think the number is like 683 database systems now that we know about. And so you can get extra credit if you write a Wikipedia style article uh, about one particular database system. So there's a ton of them in there. Pick one that you, know, you find interesting and you'll write about how it's actually implemented. Um, and you've got to provide citations and attributions, attrib uh, or att attributions for where you found this information. It's not just saying, this is what it does, because I read, it, I watched a video. You gotta actually have citations, because we're trying for this, trying to have this thing being scientific. So this is entirely optional. Uh, you don't have to do this, uh, but if you want to, the option is there. So, uh, and again, for the, for the extra credit articles, this happens every year. It drives me 
crazy. Do not plagiarize. Do not, you know, even though it's extra credit, you can still get in trouble. We still report people uh, to Warner Hall that, that, that plagiarize for the extra credit, right? Like, the reason why I'm saying this over and over again in these videos is because I'm telling you don't plagiarize. So then if you do plagiarize, I go to Warner Hall and, say, and show them this video and say, look, here's what I told the class not to plagiarize, and they plagiarize, and then So don't do that. All right, the breakdown for the grades this year is that the rereading reviews are worth 15%. Uh, Project 1 is worth 10%. Again, that's mostly designed to get you familiar with working in, in the code base. Uh, project 2 is 20%, Project 3 is 45%, the final exam is 10%, and then you can order, you can earn extra 10% uh, for your extra credit. So the, uh, all the discussion throughout the course we've done on Piazza, and that's the link there. Everyone should already been signed up, signed up uh, before the semester started. If that hasn't happened, please email me and we can fix this. Um, if you have a technical question about the projects, like I tried running this in a VM and it didn't work, or I tried compiling and it didn't work, or what does this piece of the code do? Please don't email me or Matt directly. Uh, please post on Piazza because, again, it's a group discussion. Uh, if you have questions, then other people have similar questions. Um, so Piazza is the right place to do that. Anything that's not about projects or homeworks or assignments or other things, please you email you know directly. Like if you're sick or your dog died, email me. Okay. All right. So that's it for the uh, you know for for the, the background of what the course will be about, the logistics. So now I, I want to do sort of again, a, a sort of fun mini lecture on the history of databases. So this uh, this lecture is actually based on two papers. One was written by Mike Stonebreaker called "What Goes Around Comes Around," um, and that was published in 2006. And that's sort of a retrospective of you know the history of databases up to to, to that point. And then uh, the second paper is one that I wrote with a industry analyst out of uh, out of London called "What's Really New with New SQL," and that sort of picks up. Uh, where Mike left off in 2006 and talks about the rise of, of the new SQL systems and how they sort of fit into the, the history of databases. So again, there's uh, databases are a super old topic. Uh, it's and it's surprisingly still hot today. I f love databases, so uh, it's good to understand where you know how do we get to the point where we're at we're at now. So. The main takeaway from, from those two papers is that a lot of the issues that you know, the early database systems were facing back in, you know, all the way back to the 1960s and 1970s are actually still relevant today. Uh, you know, how do you run transactions correctly? How do, you, how do you maintain indexes? All these things are still matter. It's just what's different is the hardware landscape is different. So... The one thing in particular that's, that's really fascinating about all this is that sort of how history repeats itself is the, you know, it's, it's been a decade now, but this idea of SQL versus NoSQL, uh, you know, which one was better for, you know, for, for different workloads, that's, th that debate was basically the same debate that they had in the 1970s about the relational model versus CODASIL, or the network data model. And if you've never heard of CODASIL, it's, you know, it's no surprise because it lost, right? The relational model won. That's why we, this whole course is on relational databases. So, you know, the, the, the relational data model has, has proven to be resilient and robust and, you know, useful for almost every possible database workload. Um, the only exception I would say is, is potentially machine learning because those are arrays and although you can model them in, in a relational database, it's not, you know, not the, uh, the most optimal way. So, Many of the ideas that we're talking about throughout this entire semester are not new. Again, we're, we're just discussing the modern implementations or incarnations of them. And all the times you hear me th say throughout the entire semester that, you know, for, when we talk about a particular topic, I'll say, oh, actually IBM did the same thing in the 1970s with System R, or Ingress did the same thing uh, at Berkeley in, in, in the 1970s, right? These t a lot of these techniques are not new. It's just they're now, some of them are back in fashion because the, the hardware can actually support this. So that's, I think that's super interesting, and it's you know part of the reason why databases are you know still relevant, still hot topic, um, and still in demand today. All right, so let's go back to the very beginning. One of the very first database systems uh, was developed in the 1960s called IDS, the Integrated Data Store, and so this was developed uh, at, at at GE General Electric um, internally for some customer. I think it was doing a uh, it was a, like a, a timber service or t timber company out of like Seattle. 
So they built this database system uh, and for, for this one customer, and it, it helped them with you know get, get a hold on their their, their large uh, organization. So you may be thinking, well, Andy, I've never heard of GE selling computers or selling databases. How can GE be responsible for building the first database system? What happened to them? Well, it turns out that GE at the time had this this business philosophy where they said if they can't be in the number one uh, company in a particular sector of, of the marketplace, then they didn't want to be in that market at all. So they said, well, we're not number one in computing. Let's just sell it all off. We, we don't want to be involved in that. So they sold their entire computing division to Honeywell in 1969. And as part of that, they also sold IDS. I actually don't know whether IDS is still around, around today. Um, I mean, it, it potentially is, but uh, this is usually deemed as the, one of the first database systems. So the two key things about IDS that are relevant to us are they're going to use what is called a network data model, which I'll explain in, in, in a few slides, and that when you execute queries, you're going to basically be writing a bunch of for loops that operate on a single tuple at a time. And we'll contrast with that with the relational model, which can operate on bags or sets. So the guy at actually GE that helped build IDS was this, uh, this early computer scientist named Charlie Bachman, or Charles Bachman, uh, who's actually still alive today. And he ended up leaving Honeywell in the early 1970s and went off to this, this other uh, computer company called Kulane Database Systems, which still exists today. And he helped build a new network data model system called ID IDMS, or the Integrated uh, Management System, Integrated Data Management System. And that's actually still around today. So uh, Bachman and a bunch of other people that were you know, involved in COBOL programming got together in the late 1960s and proposed a standard called Codasil uh, on, for how programs written in COBOL should access a database. Think of this, they were trying to define a standard API that every database system that, that was written in COBOL could, 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 could support. So again, based on his experience at Honeywell, this codicil was based on the network data model and therefore it operated on uh, one tuple at a time during query execution. So Bachman is, uh, you know, he was an early database pioneer and he won the, he won the Turing Award uh, for this work in the, in the early 1970s. He's like one of the first people to actually win the Turing Award you know, for, for databases. So here's what the da network data model looks like. So for this is sample application, uh, say we're like a, uh, a large engineering company and we're trying to model how uh, to keep track of all the different parts we have to buy from different suppliers to build some you know, large rocket, uh, which is actually a, a true example we'll see in a few more slides. But so I have in my database, I wanna keep track of suppliers, parts, and the, the, which supplier supplies each part. So the way the da network data model is set up is that you have these collections of data, like a supplier, a part, and supply. But then you're also gonna have to define these membership sets that that say whether a, uh, you know, a, a, a record from one set is a member of a, of a, you know, or is owned by another set. So to show an actual instance what this would look like, so say these are my, these are my collections of data, my records, supplier, part, and supply. So I would have now these membership set called supplies and supplied by that would have pointers to say for a, for, you know, for a given membership between a, parent and a child, here's all the parent pointers to the parent records, and here's all the child pointers to the child records. So now let's say I want to do a query and say, find me all the parts that are supplied by a particular supplier. I'd have to write these bunch of nested for loops that finds the, the supplier that I want, iterates over the, over the supply set, then it iterates over the supply set, then it iterates you know, over the supplied by, then I, and then I reach my, my, my part record, or part collection of data, and I can find the thing that I'm looking for. So the sort of first obvious thing to point out here is that the network data model requires you to have to write complex queries. You're essentially writing low-level for loops to traverse, this, uh, to traverse this network to find the data that you're looking for. The other issue is more of an implementation uh, uh, aspect, but the, uh, these, these, these databases turn out to be easily corruptible uh, because you know, obviously back then in the 1960s and 1970s, disks were expensive. They weren't as reliable as they are today, and people weren't, you know, maintaining multiple copies of, of data. So what would happen is if one of these these membership sets got corrupted, 
you essentially lost the whole database because now you had no way to, to know how things got, got linked together. So the, the network data model and the IDS came first, but the, another database system that was sort of built around the same time in the late 1960s uh, was this thing called IMS, or Information Management System, at IBM. So IMS is super well known. It's it's widely used still even today. If you ever use an ATM, chances are you've, you've you've interacted with an application that that talks to an IMS database. It's still around. So IMS was actually uh, a database system IBM that IBM built to keep track of the purchase orders, the parts, supplies, and supplied information uh, for the Apollo Moon mission for NASA before it was called NASA. But unlike Codasil, it didn't use a network data model, it used what is called a hierarchical data model. The other interesting aspect about IMS was that they had programmer-defined physical storage formats. So when you declared, a, you know, I have a collection of data, like a table, you also had to define what was the underlying data structure you would use to physically store that data on disk, right? Whether you want a hash table or some kind of order-preserving tree. And so also like the network data model, though, you, uh, you, you would write these for loops to traverse the, the hierarchy and do queries that op you know write queries that operate on a single tuple at a time. So, again, now in sort of simple supplier information example. Now we just have sort of two collections. We have a supplier and a part. Um, but in the instance, we we actually see a problem with a lot of redundant information. So we'd have this supplier uh, collection of data with our records, and then each of these records would have now a pointer to some other data structure that would have all their part information. So. The obvious problem we would have here is that we're duplicating data because if multiple uh, suppliers provide the same part, I have to have different uh, instances of that, you know, that, that record, in this case, large batteries, over and over again right, for every single supplier that, that sells that part. And that means now if the name of the part ever changes, I have to write extra code to go find all instances of the batteries, the large batteries, and make sure that uh, their names all get changed together at the same time and that, that, that they're, they're in sync. The other big problem, in addition to the, sort of the tuple at a time for queries, is that th there was no independence between the physical data structure of the, databases, of the database and the logical abstraction that programmers interacted with. So, for example, if, you know, if, if I declared that my table was going to be on a, use a hash table as this underlying physical data structure, but then I later, later realized, oh, I, I want to actually execute range queries, well, now I've got to dump the table out and load it back in as a B-plus tree. And then now the API that I'm exposed to for that table changes, and I have to rewrite all my application code, right? So that's, that's, a, that's, that's wasteful. It's, it's very painful. So now in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, there was this mathematician named Ted Codd who was working at IBM Research in New York. And he saw all these programmers at IBM rewriting their IMS and Codasil programs every single time the database schema changed or the layout changed. And he saw this as being wasteful, right? Because every single time the, the schema changed, the, you, know, you have to go rewrite your application code. Now, back then, uh, computers were way more expensive than humans, and so he was sort of uh, prescient in, in, this, in this goal of removing this burden because now humans are way more expensive than machines. Machines are cheap, right? So it, back then, this wasn't a, a, you know, maybe that big of an issue, although it was hard to find programmers, but certainly now, it'd be a big cost problem. And so what he came up with in the relational model was this, this high-level uh, abstraction of databases to avoid all this sort of maintenance burden on, on humans. So the relational model is, has sort of three key ideas that, uh, that are you know, widely used in, in databases today. So the first is that instead of storing the database as this hierarchy or this network with, with sort of graph structures, we instead store the database as just these simple data structures as relations or tables. Right? And now we're going to then write our program or to access the data through some high level language that can operate on these on these relations. You know, at the time in the, in the, in the first paper, uh, you know, it, it, he didn't actually propose uh, language. Right? So this is the first paper he wrote in '69, but this is the more common one that everyone cites as the relational model of for the relational model of data for large large share data banks. So in these 
in these seminal papers, he actually didn't find what this high-level language w would be. Um, of course, now we know this is SQL. But, um, at the time, SQL didn't exist. All right? So the paper is strictly, sort of, expo strictly describing the relational model from a mathematical perspective. Um, Quell was actually the first programming language uh, or query language that people uh, came up with for ingress uh, that followed the relational model. The IBM later came out with SQL, which is the SQL to Quell, it's a play on words. Um, Ted Codd actually proposed his own language called Alpha in a paper, I think in like 1975, uh, but no one, no one ever actually uses that. The other key thing that he came up with that goes beyond what IMS was doing was the physical storage representation of, of, of every relation was actually left up to the implementation of the database management system. So what that means is that I just declare that I want a table, I want a relation that has these attributes. I don't say how I actually want it stored physically. And now the database system can decide on its own how it actually wants to store things, right? If it wants to use a hash table, it wants to use a D plus tree, it can do whatever it wants. And no matter how the data changes physically underneath the covers, in theory, if I'm doing this correctly, I shouldn't have to change any of my query, uh, any, any queries in my application, because they're only operating on the database at a logical level. So these ideas sort of seem obvious today, but back then this was actually kind of controversial, right? The, the idea of having a database system be able to support a high-level language that can generate query plans as efficiently as what humans can write was considered a, uh, you know, a far-fetched idea. It's sort of back then, also you got to understand, people didn't think a high-level language like C and having a compiler for C could ever produce, you know, uh, machine code as efficient as someone writing assembly. And of course, nowadays nobody, you know, very few people actually still write assembly. We write e in even higher-level languages, right? It's, again. In, in our modern world, this, these don't seem like controversial ideas, but back then, back then it was. So, the, just to go back to our simple example before with the relational model, the, uh, now we have three relations, supplier, part, and supply, and these are going to have foreign key relationships between, between each other. So now in my installation or instance of this database system, I can just do joins now between either supplier number or the part number, to find the uh, you know, to find the the parent um, the parent record for my supply record. So now to do a lookup to find all the parts supplied by a given supplier, I can just do a join between these three tables uh, and find exactly what I want. And this also means that in a high level language, I'm operating on the database as through sets, right? I just say this is what I want you to find for me, and I don't specify you know how to iterate through you know, tuples one, one by one to find what you're looking for. Again, this is, this is a very, very powerful construct that uh, is, is sort of the basis of what we talk about for the entire semester. All right, so this now, so the relational model sort of, sort of in the 1970s when it came out, as I said, it was controversial. So it wasn't immediate right away that this is the right way to build database systems. So uh, there was a couple other relational database systems being built at the time, but the three that most people talk about still today are SystemR at IBM, Ingress at Berkeley, and Oracle, by Oracle. So SystemR was uh, at IBM Research in, in San Jose, and it wasn't led by Jim Gray, but he was probably one of the most famous people that came out of that group. Uh, Ingress was developed by one of my advisors, uh, Mike Stonebreaker. Um, if you've never heard of Ingress before, um, you may have heard of Postgres, right? So Stonebreaker has built Ingress, and then he built Postgres after Ingress. Like Postgres stands for Post Ingress, right? Uh, so again, we'll talk about those, both of those systems throughout the entire semester. And then Oracle uh, is, is a commercial system built by Larry Elson, and, and now he's like, you know, one of the most richest people in the world. So this, this listing is amazing, right? You look at Jim Gray, you look at Mike Stonebreaker, both of those guys won the Turing Award for databases. Larry Ellison, as I said, he's like the seventh or eighth richest man in the world. And this is all because of databases. Like, this is crazy. This is awesome, right? Uh, so this is why I, I, this is why I love databases, because it's, you know, not only can you do, do research that has big impact, you can make, you know, you make some decent money. You, know, you can buy your own Hawaiian island. It's awesome. All right, so there's the debate going on between the relational model and Codasil in the 1970s, but eventually the relational model went out. It was clear that this is the right way to build database systems. So Ingress and Oracle were commercialized, uh, but IBM actually never released System R as, as, as a commercial product. What they ended up releasing was, uh, in the first relational data system they did release was this thing called DB2, which is still around today, and that came out in 1983. 
So there's some bits and pieces of system R that made it into the first uh, implementation of, of, of DB2, um, but I, I don't know how much of that code still exists today. And so because for system R, they were using SQL, IBM used SQL in, in DB2, and because IBM was sort of the computer juggernaut at the time, that essentially became the standard. Um, they had to change the name though, and so instead of spelled out S-E-Q-U-E-L, it just got shortened to become SQL. Um, and I think that's because somebody, somebody sued them over, over a naming issue. So uh, SQL became the dominant, uh, dominant programming language used for databases. Ingress was supporting Quell at the time. They eventually had to support SQL, but Oracle supported SQL from the very beginning because they copied what IBM did. Um, and you know, when, when IBM came out and said, we have a SQL database, Oracle was like, oh, look, we already have one too. And then they, they essentially won the marketplace. So um, the other thing that happened in the 1980s was in addition to IBM putting out the first database, there was actually a lot of other startups that came out at the time that also built relational databases for sort of enterprise market or, or you know, commercial market. Informix, Sybase, Tandem, Nonstop SQL, Teradata was late 70s, uh, Interbase is another famous one. Right? All of these database systems are still around today, not in the exact form that they existed um, back, back in the 1980s, right? but th these are still you know, billion, dollar, billion dollar products that still make a lot of money for these companies. The other cool thing is that Stonebreaker, after uh, you know, running the Ingress company for, for a while, he goes back to Berkeley and he starts a new uh, database system built on the, you know, his lessons that he learned from, from running Ingress, uh, and he put that into a new system called Postgres. And this is actually, uh, I don't know how, obviously not much of the same code is still there, but this is, the, the same Postgres you're using today is, is a direct line to this, you know, exactly the same Postgres code, or it, it, it's, you know, derived from the Postgres code that Mike developed with his students at Berkeley um, in the 1980s. All right, so now we get into the late 1980s, and now we start to see this idea of people repeating sort of not the same mistakes, but trying to, you know, fight the same battle that maybe people that they had in the 1970s. So in the 1980s, object-oriented programming languages became more prevalent, um, and people uh, people recognize that well, if I'm writing all my application code in an object-oriented programming language like Smalltalk or C++. But now I need to, need to store things in my database. Well, my database is storing things as, as relations. So I have to take my objects, which may have nested you know, arrays and other objects inside of them. I've got to break them up and then put them into relations or single records or tuples and put that into my database. And so people recognize that or, or, or observe that this was a potential bottleneck. Right? This is called the relational object impedance mismatch. So a bunch of people said that, well, rather than taking my objects in my programming language, and then splitting them up into tuples from our relational database, what if I just could have a database system could store objects directly? So then I don't have to do that translation and, and you know, to serialize or deserialize and break things up and put them back together anytime I need to access them. So the couple of database companies that uh, came out with what are called object-oriented databases, um, Versant and Object Store are probably the two most famous ones. They still exist today, but they're essentially in, in maintenance mode. Um, this, this sort of, Category databases never really took off because there was no sort of standard way to interact with, with you know, to, to program these systems, um, and just you know, because you have to use a proprietary programming language that made you you know, tightly coupled with the database system. Where SQL is potentially a, you know, a, an open standard that anyone can implement. Um, you know, these other program, these other databases uh, were proprietary. Uh, Mark Logic is an XML database that came out in the late 1990s, but it's, it's, it was similar to these things. It was sort of an XML database. So although these systems aren't really around today and people aren't widely using them, a lot of the technologies that they developed to store data in these, in these object-oriented databases actually exist today in, in the commercial relation databases or even the open source ones, right? Anytime you store data as, as, as a JSON field or XML field, that's essentially doing the same thing that the object-oriented databases guys did back in the 1980s. So again, so as Mike said, what goes around comes around. So let's look at a quick example here. So let's say I have a, an application that I want to store student information. So every student has an ID, a name, an email address, and then an array of phone numbers. So if I want to store that in a relational database, since a student can have multiple phone numbers, I need to have a foreign key relationship between a student phone relation and a student table. And so now when I want to do a lookup to get all the information I need for a given student, 
I either have to do two queries on these two relations or do a join between them to, to get the data that I need. All right, so this, again, this is the, this would be called the object relational impedance mismatch. So what a object-oriented database would say is that, well, instead of storing this as two separate relations, what if I just stored the, all the information for a single student in a, as, a, as a JSON field, and inside that I can have my nested array. And so now to go get all the information to instantiate that object in my application code is one fetch into the database. So this seems nice, right? But now this is gonna cause problems because for a simple example, like go get one student, that's easy to do. But now if I wanna start doing aggregations across multiple students and start joining things together, not only do I have to traver have traverse the hierarchy of the every single record uh, in my query, but now I need to make sure I can join across these, these multiple records. So the queries to do complex things end up being uh, uh, more difficult than what you would have written in using SQL. The other issue is that, as I said before, there's no standard API. Even today for JSON databases, there's no standard programming language that people use to interact with these object-oriented databases. MongoDB or Redis are sort of are becoming the sort of de facto standard but there's enough, uh, there's enough document databases or, or object databases out there that do something completely different. Whereas SQL, again, the dialects are slightly different, but they're, they're still similar enough that you, know, you can understand it pretty easily. All right, so now we get to the 1990s. I typically call this the boring days of databases. And it's not to say that people weren't putting out new database systems. It's just that there wasn't any major advancement or major change in how people are going to design database systems and how people are going to, or, or kind of applications people are going to run. Yes, the internet was coming around, but you know, in the early days, there weren't that many people on the internet, and the complexity of the applications that people were building and exposing through the web were not as you know, sophisticated as they are now. So existing databases were sort of sufficient. The sort of four major events that I always like to say during this period were that Microsoft bought a license to the Sybase source code. They forked it and ported it to Windows NT, and that became SQL Server. Um, SQL Server today is still a state-of-the-art database system. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how much. I don't think that much of the Sybase code is still there, but that was their starting point. And Sybase is sort of in maintenance mode now, although it still makes a lot of money. Whereas SQL Server, I consider to be a state-of-the-art system. The next major trend was that SQL Server, or so MySQL, was what came about in the 1990s as a replacement for MSQL. Uh, and that's widely used today. Postgres uh, added support for SQL, um, and that was, it was, a, it was a, based on the academic code that was developed at Berkeley in the 1980s. Um, Postgres actually got, was forked, and then there was a, a commercial version called Illustra uh, that I think supported SQL, was eventually bought by Informix and sort of died off. Uh, but two grad students at Berkeley in the 1990s took the academic version of Postgres that only supported QL and added support for SQL. And that's why the official name of Postgres is Postgres QL, because you know, it's, it was, they added SQL after the original Postgres code was written. And then SQL Lite was started by one dude down in North Carolina, um, and it's, it's most widely used, actually most widely used embedded database and most widely used d this database in, in, in general, right, because it's used everywhere. All right, so now the big change that happened in the 2000s was, was the internet. <clears throat> so the number of users online grew significantly and the size of the databases and the, the number of concurrent operations that these systems need to support was way larger than what, you know, what, what existed before. So the problem was that all of the major sort of enterprise database systems, the Oracles, the Sybases, the, the DB2s, these were all very heavyweight. <clears throat> Uh, and they were expensive. Uh, and the open source systems like MySQL and Postgres at the time were sort of missing important features that you, you would want in a database system. So you couldn't quite use them in, in production safely. You know, so for example, MySQL didn't support transactions correctly until, you know, until InnoDB came along in, in the early 2000s. So ended up what happened was to support these larger, larger workloads, uh, a bunch of companies like Facebook, uh, uh, Google, and, and eBay and Amazon, they end up writing their own custom middleware that would sit in front of multiple single node database instances to allow them to shard out and scale. And so that would allow them to support a, a, a larger number of current users and ingest data more quickly. But now if you have a lot more data and you want to do an analytics on it, you need a specialized database system to actually su support these kind of workloads. So this was the rise of data warehouses. So these were the special purpose database systems that were built in the mid-2000s that were designed for these larger, larger data sets. 
That's not to say that the, uh, the existing database systems at the time couldn't do analytics. Uh, they were just, you know, they were sort of jack of all trades and not designed specifically for it. Whereas these newer systems were, you know, designed just to do analytics efficiently. So the, uh, the six most famous ones sort of at the time were Netiza, Parkcell, MoneyDB, Greenplum, DataLegro, and Vertica. Of these, Netiza, Parkcell, Vertica, and Greenplum were all forks of Postgres. Like they took the Postgres source code, hacked it up to make it support analytics more, more efficiently. The other thing about these systems that was different than the existing ones is that they were primarily distributed and shared nothing because that's you want to be able to scale out to do large scale analytics. Um, and unfortunately, they were, most of them were also closed source. So the key thing about them that makes them different than what was done before is that these were all column store databases. All right, so column stores has existed since the 1970s, but it wasn't until this time now, these special purpose data warehouses that people recognize that the column, uh, the, you know, the decomposition model that a column, a column store was superior for doing high performance analytics. So now we get into the late 2000s and the NoSQL movement. So how this all sort of started, is, is my take on it, was that the companies like Google recognized that for the kind of applications that they want to support on the web, they cared more about uh, making sure that the data system was always available and the, uh, that they could scale to support a large number of users. So they end up foregoing traditional things like the data system provides, like transactions and joins and, and SQL support, uh, in exchange for these sort of uh, other data models or, or proprietary languages, programming languages, or access APIs. So there's a bunch of these systems that were sort of cloned based on what Amazon had done or what Google had done, um, but other ones ca sort of came out from just somebody was building a data system at a company and recognized that you know it solved a particular problem that was useful for other people. So of these, the most famous ones are probably MongoDB, Cassandra, and, and DynamoDB. Um, most of these are open source, uh, except for DynamoDB, uh, Oracle NoSQL, and, um, and, and Bigtable. Uh, but again, the, the main thing is that they, they, were, they, were, they were called NoSQL because they weren't supporting SQL at the time, although a lot of these do, do now today, because um, they were focusing on, on, on high availability more than, than correctness. So as a response to the NoSQL movement, there was a sort of another database movement that I was involved in called NewSQL. And this is where we were trying to build uh, databases for transactional workloads that could have the same performance and scalability as a NoSQL system, but without having to give up transactions, without giving up the relational model or SQL, right? Because these are useful things to have in the databases, in a database. So, uh, Unfortunately, most of these, at least when the, the new SQL system originally started, most of these were closed source. Uh, the kind of cool thing now is in recent years, with, with like CockroachDB, TidyDB, and Yugabyte, um, some of the newer, newer new SQL systems are actually open source. So that, that's pretty exciting. Spanner is probably the most famous one at Google uh, out of all of these, um, and they do transactions using special hardware clocks, which we're not going to discuss uh, this semester. All right, so now the 2010s and, and 2000s, this is sort of the rise of these specialized database systems. So these are where now, instead of just building to a, 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 a single purpose database system that could try to do everything, uh, you, you try to build these, you know, ones that can do transactions or one that could do analytics efficiently, but not the other. But then in the later 2000, mid 2010s was these HTAP systems or hybrid systems where it was trying to get the best of both worlds. It was like, and it was trying to be a new SQL system, system where you could do transactions very quickly, but you also wanted to support some of the analytics that you would only be able to run on a, on a data warehouse. And the idea here was that uh, instead of having have maintained two, two separate databases, one for transactions, one for analytics, you could push some of those analytical operations directly to the front end system, and you know extrapolate new knowledge, new information on the data as it arrives in the database system. So of these, HANA, Splice Machine, and MemSQL are probably the two most famous ones. Hyper is originally started as an academic system, but it got bought by Tableau uh, a few years ago and is now a commercial system that comes with Tableau's uh, software. Hyper is actually an amazing system. We are actually going to discuss it uh, multiple times throughout the entire semester. And next class, or, or later this week, I'm actually going down to the Hyper headquarters to try to get, you know, go through like a German seance or get some German influence in my life to, to help me build a better database system. 
So uh, look forward to that uh, in, in the next class. So some of these are open source, some of these are closed source. Again, but all of these are going to support the relational model in SQL because that's sort of the, the, the main thing people want, especially for analytics. The other big thing that happened in 2010 was the, the, the advent of cloud systems. So these are now database systems that are designed specifically to run in, in the cloud environment. And so how these first started were like the major cloud vendors would sell you a database as a service that were just taking an existing database system like Oracle or MySQL or Postgres and running them inside a container or a VM for you. But since then, there's been newer database systems that are designed specifically for running in a cloud environment or shared disk environment, which I'll show in the next slide. Right? So these are database systems that are not necessarily built from the ground up, but they're, the systems assumes it's running in a cloud environment and therefore it takes into account the latency of accessing disks that may not be local to the machine uh, where, the, where the compute is actually running. So of these, Snowflake, uh, Redshift, Aurora, and everything from Amazon, Spanner, Bigtable, and Cosmos DB are probably the most famous ones. Zeround was a uh, cloud version of MySQL uh, that went under. Um, it's based out of Israel. They, they failed a few years ago. FaunaDB is a, uh, is a serverless uh, OTP system, and Slicing Dice is a, I think, a cloud, cloud service for MySQL uh, based out of South America. So there's a bunch of other ones, but these, these are the, the, one, the main ones that I'm showing. So as part of building a cloud database, you had uh, this new architecture that was assuming a shared disk, uh, a shared disk environment. So that means that instead of having to write a custom storage manager in your database system that accesses like a lo local disk, you would use the existing uh, you know, interfaces or API that the cloud vendor provided you or a distributed file system will provide you and use that as the underlying data store. Right? So think of this instead of writing to you know, a, a proprietary, uh, uh, you know, a local file that's you know, managed on the disk, I would write my data out to HDFS or Amazon's S3 or e EBS. So in these environments, uh, the, the storage layer is usually append only. And so these are gonna favor, or you're gonna typically use a log structured approach because you, know, you, just, you, just, you just keep appending to the log. So this is what most people think about when they talk about uh, building a data lake. It's usually something like this where they have a bunch of files on a distributed file system or a distributed object store, and you just build it. You, have this, you point the data system at it, and you suck the data in and, and, do, and run, you know, run your queries on it. So again, although we're not going to talk about shared disk systems or distributed databases, you, know, you have to bring the data from the shared disk into a compute node. And at that point, it's in memory, and so you're going to do all the things that we're going to talk about throughout the entire semester, right? So even though we're not talking about explicitly distributed databases, our techniques that we're talking about here are still used in them. The other cool thing about shared disk systems is that because now we've separated the compute layer with the storage layer, I can scale them out independently because the execution layer is essentially stateless. Right? The, the final state of the database is always on the shared disk. So if now I can't process queries fast enough, then I can just keep adding new in your compute nodes and start you know, running more queries in parallel. Likewise, if I need to start scaling out more machines, I can just add, add new disk in the shared, shared disk layer. All right, so I briefly want to talk about graph databases, although it's starting to rain here. Um, the, every year people always ask me, why don't I cover graph databases in, in the class? And the answer is I have not really seen a from the low-level systems perspective that I care about, I've not seen a compelling argument for why you do want to use a graph database. Uh, the only really management that they have over existing systems is that they're going to provide you a graph-centric query API. So that means it's like if I want to do a graph traversal, instead of you know as I walk the graph going back and forth between the application and the and this and the database back and forth to, to do that traversal, I have a single command that does the traversal, and then it all runs on the server side. So but there's nothing specific about that that makes that says you know you couldn't do that in a relational database that's storing a graph. And in fact, there's a recent research, eh, it's a few years ago, 2015, in CIDR that shows that it's actually not clear that using a graph-centric, a specialized graph-centric database system is going to do any better over a existing relational database system with a graph API. So for that reason, uh, we're just not going to talk about graph databases this entire semester. The other major trend, uh, this this. Uh, this decade, uh, or these 2010s, 
is the, the advent of these time series databases. So again, these are more specialized database systems that are specifically designed to store time series event data. Right? Think of like a monitoring service where you're collecting the, the CPU utilization from every machine in, in a data center you know, once a second. So all these events get sucked into a, a time series database and they can do you know, analytics or do analysis on them to find whether you know, there's any issues. So the reason why I bring up the time series databases is that this is actually a good example uh, about how if you make assumptions about what the, the, the data looks like and the workload patterns you're trying to execute on, then you can actually apply some additional optimizations at the storage layer and the, uh, and the execution layer uh, for them. So you could make the same argument about, about graph databases. It's just at the execution layer, maybe, or the, the planning level, but at the low level storage level, it's the relational model can still do this. So time series databases, they're still relational. It's just there are, uh, they, they know what the queries are, patterns are going to look like, and so they can optimize for it. So of these, the ones that's probably the most interesting to us in this semester is ClickHouse out of Russia. Um, I'll spend a little time talking about how they do things because it's actually a super state-of-the-art system that does a lot of the things that we're going to talk about this entire semester. And it's open source, so that's, so that's very cool. All right, so again, the, the, the major trend, I would say, of the last decade is just the rise of these specialized systems. No longer it's, it's you know, Oracle or SQL Server DB2 that tries to do everything for everyone. There's enough database systems out there that, that can, that are for you know, different classes of workloads. Again, a lot of these will still be relational. It's just how they actually implement things and can be tailored towards a particular uh, uh, you know, application environment or domain. So there's a bunch of embedded databases that are interesting that we're not gonna have time to talk about. Multimodal databases or multimodal databases are systems that try to do you know, graphs and, and documents and, 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 and key value stores all within a single database. Blockchain databases are a thing, apparently. Um, again, I don't find them very interesting or compelling. At least maybe I just don't understand it enough to say that they're, they're a good reason for them. Uh, so we're not going to talk about them. And there's also hardware accelerator databases. We'll talk a little bit at the end of the semester. Basically, databases that not just running on the CPU, but could you run on FPGAs, GPUs, or you know, new non-volatile memory. So the main takeaway I want you to get from all of this is that there are a ton of database systems out there uh, that all do, do things differently. Uh, and sometimes they make good decisions, sometimes they don't, they don't make good decisions. And so the goal of this semester is to sort of understand these trade-offs of all the different design points of building a database system so that you know, when you go out in the real world and someone comes along and says, hey, I have this great new database that you, you should give me money, mo money for, or you should start using, you, you can now make an, un an educated evaluation about whether that's actually a good idea or not. All right, so here's what I think is going to happen in the future. I think that uh, the specialized databases that start off very specialized, over time as they get more users and see adoption, they will sort of expand the scope in which uh, the type of problems they'll be able to support. So the time series databases maybe don't do transactions very well, but eventually they will add transactions. Or maybe they, they don't do analytics very well in, in a document database, but eventually they'll, they'll do analytics better. Um, eventually some databases will just people will stop using and they go into maintenance mode and then die off. Um, but the ones that, that do thrive, I think, will just, again, they'll just get better over, over time. It is also my opinion that the relational model and particular programming languages are a boon for doing high-quality engineering uh, or data engineering in, in an organization. Right? So instead of just having a bunch of Python scripts that are, are hacking up the data, if you have a way to sort of programmatically define what the data looks like, uh, and, and operate them on in, in sort of structured manner, then that makes it easier you know, for other people to reuse what you're doing. It may not be the fastest way for you to do it uh, in terms of you, know, you actually writing the software, but for an organization that has a lot of people touching data, I think this is actually the better approach. Um, that's a, sort of just my opinion. All right, so next class, we will do the introduction on intermemory databases, uh, just sort of un to just contrast them with disk-based databases and try to understand why they're different, how they're different, and uh, you know, that'll be the underlying assumption we make throughout the entire semester. And uh, for Wednesday's class, you also have to submit your first reading review, so go check this course schedule and see what paper you have to read, and then submit that in the link below. Okay? So it's like, I don't know, 10.30 at night, it's getting kind of smoky here. Um, let, me, uh, let me go 
figure out where, where 18701 is and, and we'll figure out where we're staying and then hopefully I can record the next class uh, when I'm down in Germany in, at, at the Hyper headquarters. All right, guys, take it easy. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Yeah.